Wherever you're coming from this morning emotionally, I'm glad you're here. If you're here for the first time, I want to welcome you. I'm visiting as well, but I wasn't always a visitor here. About 10 years ago, my family and I were members here at Riverside. And um, you know, I say this often when I'm here, and if you've heard it before, you're going to hear it again because it's always thick in my heart. Um, and my family and I walked through some really deep waters when we were here. Our first daughter was born um, nine years ago this past Friday, and she was born with some significant health problems that we knew some of when she was coming, but we didn't know the extent of until she was here. And she ended up being with us just nine weeks. Um, and so whenever I'm back in West Lafayette, there's a flood of memories, um, really treasured memories with our daughter, but also really hard memories, but also memories of, of you as a church family coming around us and supporting us. And so again, if you're here for the first time, welcome. Um, this is a special place. And I think that if you continue to come and to engage here, I think you'll find that to be true as well. Um, another thing I should have shared uh, in talking about what I do, but it's hard to pair together with the stories that I just told, is that we reach out to Thai people in Dayton. And you know, as I mentioned, we're missionaries in Thailand. And so one of the ways that I do that in Dayton is by interpreting. And so I might get a call from the interpreting company and they might say, hey, we have somebody requesting an interpreter at a doctor's office or a hospital or a courtroom. Can you go and do that? And so that's kind of fun. Um, my first client was a woman who was 20 weeks pregnant. And so I was in the prenatal appointment with her, the first of many with her, actually. Uh, ladies, if you remember the kinds of questions that you get asked at those, <laughs> I was right there interpreting them all. Um, and, you know, we built a friendship with, with her and her husband and had him over for dinner. And as she got closer to the due date, she asked if I would be at the birth. And I was honored to be asked, but also a little nervous of what that might mean. Um, but one morning, uh, about a year ago, I got a call. And it's time, so I rush off to the hospital. And I don't really know what to do because I've only been in my wife's birth. And, you know, I'm not even comfortable there. And so, <laughs> truly not. And so, go into the, you know, get her checked in into the room and everything. And then it's her and her husband and me just sitting there. And, you know, my wife handles pain internally. And so, there's not a lot of external, ex, you know, expression. This woman was different than that. So, she was, you know, moaning a lot of groaning. And I'm, okay, it's dark. Okay. So, the doctor comes in, checks things out. Well, she says, I'll be back in a couple hours. And I'm thinking, oh, no. <laughs> what, what am I going to do for a couple hours? So I talked to the husband a little bit. And, you know, the wife is still in lots of pain. Nothing I can do. And so I said to the husband, I said, well, you know, maybe I'll check back as well. And he said, oh, yeah, that's fine. I talked to the nurse, went home, which we live close to the hospital. And I get home. My wife's like, what are you doing here? I was like, you know, explain the situation. She said, you can't, you got to go back. That's the whole reason you're there. And I said, okay. So took a quick shower, went back, took my work this time, took my laptop, talked to the nurse. I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to be right out here. You know, there's the end of the hallway. There's a chair. So I'm sitting there doing my work, hearing things going on. I'm like, you know, if you need me, I can be there. Baby, I hear the baby out. I'm like, great. Praise the Lord. Baby's out, and I'm getting ready, right? Getting my stuff packed up. I'll just pop in, make sure everything went well. And as my stuff's about to be totally packed up, this woman walks up, up to me, and she says, hey, are you the interpreter? I say, yes. She said, hi, I'm the lactation consultant. <laughs> yeah. They needed me for that. <clears throat> so that's part of our calling in Dayton as well. Uh, I did interpret that. My back was turned the whole time, so it was fine. Um, but whether I'm working with pastors and churches or whether I'm working with Thai people, the focus of what I do is to make disciples. That's my calling. That's all of our callings, really. And I want to make a deal with you this morning. If you will stay attentive to me as best as you can, I'm going to do the best that I can to give you a Vujade experience. 
Now, bouja de, what is that? You probably heard of deja vu, right? Deja vu is when you have an experience when you're in a place for the first time, but it feels like you've been there before. Well, bouja de's experience is the opposite of that. It's when you've seen something or been somewhere lots of times, but you feel like you've never been there before. And you feel like you've never seen it before. You know, the way that I impact guys like Pastor Dean and other church leaders is by spending time with them. And then when Jesus spent time with his disciples in John 3, the Greek word that's used there literally means to rub through someone's skin. To rub through someone's skin. And if we were to put that in our vernacular, we might say something like to get under the skin of. And today I hope to get under your skin. That's one of my goals this morning, is to get under your skin, possibly in an annoying way, possibly not, uh, but to get under your skin. And we're going to focus just on two questions this morning. What is a disciple? And what is the fruit of a disciple? And I didn't even mention, did we have the slide up about a doula? I forgot that part. That was one of the less awkward pictures of a doula. Um, my wife calls me a doula because of that whole experience, so that's what I should have tied in there. I'm like, I'm not a doula. So anyway, that's a midwife, if you don't know. Um, what is a disciple? Disciple is one of those words where there's lots of confusion around it, isn't there? All right now, maybe if you haven't grown up in the church, it's one of those words you don't even hear that often. Maybe you heard it a few times growing up, and it normally referred to somebody outside the church as someone that didn't have a lot of creative thought, not a lot of originality. You know, a disciple of Bill Belichick would be, you know, a coach that kind of does what he did, disciple of Martha Stewart. But we didn't even hear it that much outside of the church. But if you've grown up in the church, you've probably heard it lots and lots, and especially these days. Because a disciple is one of those words, it's a buzzword in Christianity right now. And we don't really have a lot of clarity about what it means. I've been in some churches where their discipleship program involves having, having people get the coffee ready in the morning and set out the snacks. That's their discipleship. And that's what they tell me. You know, we're, we're training our people by doing that. Other people talk about, other churches talk about how it's Bible studies, uh, programs, Sunday school events, stuff like that. But not only does the word lack clarity, but we use it in different ways, don't we? Disciple, it's a noun, but we also have a verb, right? Disciple. Are you discipling anybody? Do you know how to disciple? And we also have this word, the SS disciple, I like to call it, discipleship. I don't know what that is, right? Is that just where the disciples were in that boat and going across the Sea of Galilee? Is that discipleship? I don't know. We know, we know that Jesus had disciples, don't we? But how many did he have? Did he have 12? 40? 72? 120? Were the 12, were they, were they disciples or were they apostles? Are they the same? Is there a difference between a disciple and an apostle? What about this word Christian? Are all disciples Christians? Or is a Christian something different than a disciple? Maybe a disciple are like the Christian all-stars, right? You know, the people that are really Christians. Those are the ones that we call disciples. We don't know. There's so much confusion around this word that Scripture uses in the Gospels and in Acts, the word disciple is used 269 times. Just in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, 269 times. And it's clear that the people that are reading the Scripture, the ones that were, the Scripture was intended to be read by initially, understood the word and understood the context in which the word was, was given into. By comparison, Christian is only used three times in the whole New Testament. The fact is, Jesus called people to be disciples, not, not Christians. I think if we're going to understand the word, we need to look historically at where did the word come from. The first written use of the word disciple was written in 500 BC by Herodotus, a Greek historian. And if you have any definition in your mind of what a disciple is, it probably comes from the Greek word methetes, which means learner. A disciple is a learner. If we're going to look at that Greek word and just translate it literally, learner. But that's not specific enough, because there's different types of learners, aren't there? 
There's a type of learner that goes to school, a student. We have the student-teacher relationship. We also have a master or an apprentice. Well, that's a different type of learning. That'd be more focused on skills, where over here, a teacher and a student would be more focused on knowledge. So if we just stay there at learner, it's not specific enough for us to understand what a disciple is or what we are to be as disciples. So what I want to do is I want to dip into the history of right around when Jesus was born, into Jewish history. What was this word disciple? Well, to understand that, we need to understand a bit of the Jewish culture that was happening then. So if you were a parent at that time, you would send your kids off to school right around the same time we do. Boys and girls would both go to a school called Beth Sefer. And Beth Sefer literally means house of the book. And boys and girls would go, and the curriculum would be the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the students were taught to read, to write, and to recite. To memorize and then recite. And so this is what their schooling looked like. Both boys and girls, every Jewish child would be going to the school. When they finished with this school around the age of 12, 13, 14 years old, the girls would be sent off for marriage and begin to take their place in society. Right? At that age, that's the way it was in those days. The boys, most of them would go off and they would learn a trade. And normally it's their father's trade is what they would learn. But some of them, some of the boys would not go off to trade school. They would begin in another school, the next level, called the Beth Midrash. At the Beth Midrash, they would expand their study from the first five books of the Old Testament to all of the Old Testament. And they would continue to learn to recite. And they would be working on memorizing the entire Old Testament. Let me say that again. They would be, work on memorizing the entire Old Testament. Wow. Oh, we have trouble memorizing one verse sometimes, don't we? But this is what the schooling looked like for Jewish children. Towards the end of their teenage years, some of the, the boys would be invited to go and learn a trade from their father. The rabbi would say, you know, I think, I think it's time. I think it's time that you go learn the trade of your father. But there would be others in that school that the rabbis would look at and they would say, hey, I think it's time for you to become my Talmud. And so they would become Talmud, those that would say, okay, yes, I will do that. I'll become your Talmud. And Talmud is a word that we probably haven't heard before and aren't familiar with, but the Talmud was a follower of the rabbi. And the goal of the Talmud was to become just like the rabbi. The Talmud is the Hebrew word. Methetes is the Greek word. Disciple is the English word. And so those students that would become the Talmud, they would follow their disciple, their rabbi. They would walk with the rabbi. They would talk with the rabbi. They would listen to the rabbi. They would eat with the rabbi. They would live and stay with the rabbi. 24-7, they would be with the rabbi for one reason. Because they were going to become just like the rabbi. And after a few years of this type of following and this type of pursuit of the rabbi, the Talmud would continue in moving towards and becoming like the rabbi. And one day, one day the rabbi might turn to the Talmud and say something like this, as far as it is possible, you are now like me. Now go and seek others who will imitate you, because when they imitate you, they will be imitating me, because you are like me. Sounds similar to the Great Commission, doesn't it? And there's a saying in Jewish culture for the Talmud that they would want to be covered in the dust of the rabbi. They would want to be following so closely to the rabbi that they would just be covered by his dust as he walked on the dusty streets. And he went and taught in the synagogue and he went to teach in some of the public forums. Talmud, a disciple. 
When we understand and have a proper understanding of the word disciple, it tells us who we are and what we're to be focused on. You see, but in the Western church, we don't get that, do we? Because most of us weren't introduced to Jesus as our rabbi or as our main teacher. We get introduced to Jesus as our spiritual janitor. Because we make a lot of messes and we need somebody to come along behind and clean it up. And then maybe we come to church because we want to make sure that the janitor is still going to be with us. Because we know that we're still making messes. And we still need Jesus to come behind and take care of our sin. But Jesus says he calls us to be disciples. Tell me to become like him. That the, that the driving passion of our life is to become just like him him. Are you a Talmud? Are you a disciple? See, our problem today is we have separated the teachings of Jesus. We've separated them into the teachings of Jesus, and we've separated the methods of Jesus, or what he did and how he did it. And 90 to 95 percent of all Christian teachings is focused right here on the teachings of Jesus. But we don't even consider what he did or what he's calling us to do or how he did it. But a Talmud is interested in this and this. And then we wonder, why don't we get the results of Jesus? Well, we've separated the teachings from the methods. Of course we're not going to get the results. We're focused on our character. We're focused on becoming like him morally. But we're, we don't even think about becoming like him in practice and in pursuit and in way of life. We believe that information leads to transformation, and it doesn't. If it does, we'd all be millionaires with six-pack abs. Doesn't work. Information does not lead to transformation. Incarnation leads us down the road towards transformation if we combine it with application. So with this backdrop of a Talmud, of a disciple, a disciple is someone who follows Jesus to become just like Jesus. I want to get into scripture this morning, and I want to start looking at this next question. What is the fruit of a disciple? And as we open up into Mark, and we're going to be reading Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, I want us to listen to this as if we are part of Jesus' Talmud, that we are with him and walking right behind him, seeking to be covered in his dust and to learn to be just like him. And as we read the scriptures, let's, let's figure out, well, what might we experience? What are the things and reactions that we might have? And to set the context before we start reading in the scripture, we're right towards the end of Jesus' public ministry. At least two and a half years in, he has just had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem Right, what we celebrate on Palm Sunday, he's riding on the donkey. The crowds are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And they have come from that. They, Mark tells us they went to the temple, but it was too late. And so they went back out to spend the night at Bethany, which was just a mountainside, probably right outside of Jerusalem. Okay, so we're going to pick up there. And this is a, a passage that you've probably heard before and probably been perplexed by. We're going to pick it up in verse 12 of chapter 11. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went out to find if there was any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Well, his disciples heard him say because they were with him, right? Always with him. And so if you were there, what would you have experienced? What would you be thinking? You just saw Jesus look in the distance and see a tree. He might have commented on it. We don't know. See a tree with leaves on it. He was hungry. He had to have mentioned that or else the writer wouldn't have known it. And so he's looking at that tree. He's hungry and he begins to walk towards it. And as you follow him to that tree... You see him get up to the tree and there's no figs. And then he curses the tree. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was with him, I might think, boy, Jesus is a little hangry this morning, isn't he? <laughs> I mean, 
He said, I mean, okay, there's no, there's no fruit, Jesus. Okay, well, let's just keep going. Maybe there'll be another tree with fruit on it. Maybe we'll find a different kind of tree. Right, but we don't understand a lot of the things that are going on in this culture. And so a lot of times we just read a passage like this and kind of tilt our head like, I don't know. Well, maybe I can get to the Psalms this morning instead. Right? But if we dig in a little bit, we can see what's going on. So Jesus is clearly hungry. He goes to that tree expecting figs. Now, let me ask you this question. If it wasn't the season for figs, why would he go and expect figs to be there or something to eat to be there? Well, that doesn't make sense. Now, if we combine some cultural understanding, then we know that fig trees get figs before they get leaves. Okay, actually, not figs. They get these things called tarks or toks. Taksh, T-A-Q-S-H. They get taksh, and the taksh is kind of like a pre-fig. Then later on, drop off, and the fig takes its place. Now, Mark is not writing to a Jewish audience. Now, a Jewish audience knows what time of year it is, because he's, he's already talked about the Passover, and they're moving towards the Passover. So they know, the Jewish audience knows, that it is late March or early April. Late March or early April is the time for these pre-figs to be on the tree. It's not the time for figs. Those haven't come yet. But what Mark, I think, is trying to communicate to his reader is when Passover is, what time of year is it? It's not the season for figs, because if it was the season for figs, then a non-Jewish reader might think, well, maybe they would all been picked off already. Maybe this tree did have figs, and they'd already been harvested. No, it wasn't the time for figs. Now, we know that peasants would go through and they would pick off these pre-figs and eat them. And so Jesus is moving towards this fig tree and expecting this pre-fig to be there. And it's not. And then he's upset and he curses the tree. Well, the point of a tree is to yield fruit. Figs, right? That's the, that's the reason, that's the way they propagate themselves. And this tree had no figs or no prefigs. Now, when we think about the priorities of Christ, not just the character of Christ, but the priorities of Christ, fruit is extremely important to Jesus. You can look in John 15, it would be another place that we're not going to go this morning, but you could look at later today about the importance of fruit. Now, most scholars will tell you, and I, I agree with them, that this passage is in the Gospel of Mark and what Mark is trying to communicate is the fig tree represents Israel. And we see that throughout the Old Testament. And so we see a coming judgment upon Israel. And right after this scene, Jesus goes into the temple and cleans out the temple for the second time, overturns the tables. Okay? But I don't think if we were following Jesus at that time and witnessed this, we would think, oh, this is about, this is about Israel. There's a coming judgment. I think they would be puzzled, but I'd also think they, they would see the importance of fruit. And you know what really angers Jesus here? Is there's the appearance of fruitfulness without fruitfulness. There's the appearance of fruitfulness without fruitfulness. And as we would probably surmise, Jesus went to the fig tree and expected to find apples on that tree. Right? Apples on a fig tree? We've all seen that, haven't we? Special trick of the fig tree? No. No, fig trees bear figs. Apple trees bear apples. Orange trees bear oranges. We reproduce in kind because that's what fruit does. That's how fruit operates. Right? And so what should the fruit of a disciple be? See, normally most Christians think about, when we think about the fruit that we should bear, we think about the fruit of the Spirit, don't we? Galatians 6, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And we think, yes, this is the fruit that Jesus is calling me to bear, are these things, the fruits of the Spirit. Tell me why. Tell me why in nature we look out and all the trees and all the animals bear fruit in kind. Dogs bear spiritual fruit. Dogs bear fruit of puppies. Cats 
bear fruit of kittens. People bear fruit of children. Why do we think that the fruit of a disciple should be the fruit of a spirit? The fruit of a disciple is a disciple. Well, Justin, if that's true, then what's all, what's all this fruit of the spirit about? Well, just like the fig tree and the apple tree and the orange tree don't just sit out um, seeds at the end of their branches. There's fruit around it. There's flesh around that seed that's intended towards reproduction. And the flesh around it helps that seed grow in the soil and in the ground. And so I'm not here telling you that we shouldn't bear the fruit of the Spirit because we should. But the fruit of the Spirit is intended to help us bear the fruit of reproduction because fruit is not decoration. Fruit is intended for reproduction. That's why trees bear fruit. Trees bear fruit so that they can reproduce themselves. The flesh around it helps it to do that. The fruit of the Spirit that we are to bear is to help us to bear that fruit of another disciple in someone else's life. Try to bear the fruit of a disciple without being loving. Let me know how that goes. It's not going to go well. And so the fruit of the Spirit is that flesh around the seed of the gospel that we are called to plant in other people's lives. Because we are called to be just like Jesus. And Jesus already sent us out. And he said, now you go and make disciples. Are you a disciple? What kind of fruit are you bearing? I believe a lot of the reasons why we have so many people in the churches that don't understand what a disciple is and they are, cannot honestly call themselves a disciple is because they've never been invited. They've never been taught and they've never been invited. I'm here today to do both. I'm inviting you to be a disciple. I'm inviting you to be a disciple. I'm inviting you to be a disciple. Every person in this room, I am inviting you and imploring you to follow Jesus, to become just like Jesus. Not just in his character, but in his practices. Because our world is falling apart and our culture is falling apart because we don't have people to do it. And people look at Christians and they say, well, I don't know, I don't, I don't really want to be like those people. Not you, of course, not you guys. But when people look at Jesus, they fall in love with him. And when people look at people that look just like Jesus, they fall in love with Jesus. Are you a disciple? If you're not, are you willing to drive a stake down in your life today and say, you know what, I'm going to start on that path of following Jesus to become just like him? Are you bearing the fruit of a disciple? If not, are you willing to start with the taksh, to begin with some pre-fruit, some steps of obedience, some steps of faith towards him so that you can bear the fruit of a disciple. I'm here to tell you there's nobody in this room that can't do it. For the past 20 years, I've been working with people like you and people that have a lot less advantages than you have. There's nobody here that can't do it. I'm going to close with this verse, Isaiah 60, 22. It says, The least of you will become a thousand, the smallest a mighty nation. I am the Lord, and it's time I will do this swiftly. Isaiah 60, 22. You know, that's encouraged me so many times. 
Because when I'm feeling discouraged, when I'm feeling overwhelmed by the task of becoming like Christ, I go to that verse and I remember, you know what, I'm at least the least. That's, that's the very bottom, right? I'm at least there. God, would you help me? Let's close in prayer. God, just thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that, um, that this would get under people's skin this morning. God, you know those whose, whose hearts and consciences you've been pricking this morning as I've spoken. And I pray that you would bug them. And I pray that they, if they are resistant to what you're leading them to do and to become, I pray that you would disturb their sleep at night. God, I pray that they would not be able to escape the call that you've given to them and the ministry that you have for them. Lord, we thank you for the incredible privilege it is to know you and to be known by you. We thank you that if we run from you, you love us. If we resist, if we resist you, you're patient with us. I pray that you would help us to see that the way of a disciple is to follow you and to bear the fruit of other disciples. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.